The Friendship Paradox Imagine scrolling through your social media feed. Everyone seems to have more friends, more followers, more connections than you. You feel a little left out. But what if that feeling isn't just in your head? What if it's actually true mathematically? This is the friendship paradox. On average, your friends have more friends than you do. That sounds impossible at first, but let's break it down. In any social network, whether it's real life friendships or online followers, some people are way more connected than others. These highly connected people show up in many people's friend lists because they're more likely to be friends with everyone. So when you look at the average number of friends your friends have, those super connected people skew the numbers upward. It's like walking into a party where everyone knows each other except you. You're not imagining it. Statistically, you really are less connected than your friends on average. It's not about you. It's about how networks behave. And it doesn't just stop at friendships. The friendship paradox appears in many areas of life. Your co-workers might, on average, be more productive than you. Your classmates might get higher grades on average. Even your neighbors might seem wealthier or more active. Because in each case, the most visible or connected people influence the average. This paradox has real-world applications. In epidemiology, for example, targeting highly connected individuals for vaccines or information can slow disease spread more effectively. Why? Because those people reach more of the network, just like in the paradox. In social media, it fuels feelings of inadequacy. You're constantly exposed to the most visible, followed, or celebrated people. Not the average person, but the most connected ones. The lesson of the friendship paradox is simple, but powerful. What feels average to you often isn't. Our perception is biased by how networks work. So the next time you think everyone is doing better, remember, it might just be a paradox, not a personal failure. The Sleeping Beauty Paradox Imagine this strange experiment. On Sunday, Sleeping Beauty is told the rules. She'll be put to sleep, and a fair coin will be flipped. If the coin lands heads, she will be awakened once on Monday, then the experiment ends. If it lands tails, she will be awakened twice, once on Monday, and again on Tuesday, but with her memory of the Monday awakening erased. Each time she wakes up, she doesn't know what day it is, or how many times she's already been awakened. She only remembers being told the setup. Now, here's the question. When Sleeping Beauty wakes up, what should be her belief that the coin landed heads? At first, it seems obvious. The coin is fair, so the chance should be 50 50 right? But here's where the paradox begins. Some argue her belief should be one-third. Why? Because there are three possible awakening situations. One waking on Monday after heads. Two, waking on Monday after tails. Three, waking on Tuesday after tails. Only one of those corresponds to heads. So if she wakes up with no idea what day it is, the probability that this awakening is the heads case is one out of three. But others argue the answer is still one half because the coin flip was fair, and the setup doesn't change the coin's basic probability. So which is it? One half or one third? That's the sleeping beauty paradox. A debate between two perspectives. The halfers, who say the probability remains 50%, and the thirders, 
who factor in how many awakenings happen under each outcome. It's a battle between frequency and credence, between what's true in the setup and what's experienced in the moment. The paradox has sparked debates in philosophy, statistics, and probability theory. It forces us to question what we mean by likelihood when self-locating belief, knowing where or when you are, is uncertain. In the end, Sleeping Beauty wakes up in confusion, and we're left wondering, is the world more about facts or how we experience them? The Infinite Monkey Theorem Imagine placing a monkey in front of a typewriter. The monkey randomly presses keys. No logic, no language, just pure chance. Now imagine giving the monkey infinite time. Days, years, centuries, forever. The Infinite Monkey Theorem says, Given enough time, that monkey will almost surely type the complete works of Shakespeare. Every play, every poem, every comma, perfectly. It sounds ridiculous. How can randomness create something so complex and meaningful? But here's the logic. There are a finite number of keys on a typewriter and a finite number of characters in Shakespeare's work. So while the chances of typing even one correct sentence are astronomically small, those odds never drop to zero. Over infinite time, every possible combination of characters will eventually be typed, including Hamlet, the Bible, your name, and this script. It's a paradox of probability versus practicality. Mathematically, it's true, but in reality, it's completely impossible to witness. Even if the monkey typed non-stop for billions of years, the odds of accidentally producing a single sonnet are still near zero. But infinity breaks our rules. It turns the improbable into the inevitable. This theorem is more than just a quirky idea. It touches on deep concepts in mathematics like infinite sets, randomness, and the nature of probability. It's also used as a metaphor for things like evolution, creativity, and artificial intelligence. Given enough trials, randomness can produce order. Even if it looks like chaos along the way, the infinite monkey theorem reminds us, in an infinite universe, even the impossible isn't impossible, just extremely wildly, absurdly unlikely.